Israelis and Palestinians in Gaza are spending a fourth night being bombarded by rockets and missiles as Israeli defence forces and Hamas militants continue fighting. We'll have the latest from Kafa Aza Kibbutz, where soldiers have been removing the bodies of residents killed by Hamas, including women and children. And we'll also get an update from our correspondent who spent his entire life living in Gaza. He says the attacks have been the worst he's ever seen. We'll also talk to a hostage negotiator about the difficult task of bringing both sides to the table to save as many lives as possible. And we'll bring you a special interview with one of Joe Biden's top national security spokespersons and advisers, John Kirby. All that and more coming up tonight on The Context. Thick black smoke fills the air over Gaza tonight following a further day of intense Israeli airstrikes. The Palestinian militant group Hamas has responded with barrages of rockets into southern Israel. The number of dead on both sides continues to rise with little prospect of a swift end to the violence. Well, this was the scene in Gaza today. UN aid agencies have warned of the severe consequences of Israel's siege on the territory. Palestinian officials say more than 800 people have been killed by the strikes. The World Health Organization has called for a humanitarian corridor to be opened into the area. The families of more than 100 Israelis ha taken hostage have been speaking about their agony. The Israeli army says it's contacted the families of 50 soldiers seized by Hamas. At least 123 Israeli soldiers have been killed since Saturday. At least 1,000 Israelis are now known to have been killed in the Hamas attacks. Earlier today, Israelis were sent fleeing again in the town of Ashkelon after Hamas fired more missiles. Well, our international editor, Jeremy Bowen, has been to Kafar Alza, where soldiers have been removing the bodies of people murdered by Hamas, including women and children. A warning that you may found some of the elements of this report distressing. The first few days of war at this small Israeli community called Kfar Alza are a microcosm of Israel's trauma and a glimpse of what might come next. Israeli troops only seized back full control of the kibbutz this morning. It's one of a series of small Israeli villages along the Gaza wire. When we arrived, they were still firing on houses across on the Gaza side. Israeli combat soldiers only started their fight back here at around 6 o'clock on Saturday evening, around 12 hours after Hamas attacked. These men are experienced soldiers, combat reservists. They said fighting their way back in against a determined enemy was hard going. How, how difficult was the fighting? I can't imagine. Have you ever had to do anything like this before as a soldier? No, not like this. What happens next? What do you do next? What does Israel do next? I don't know. I would, I would do what he will tell me to do. I will do. I hope that we will go inside. Into Gaza? Yeah. That's going to be tough fighting. Yeah, we're ready for it. Kafar Aza was taken by surprise, like everywhere else Hamas attacked. The kibbutz guard, armed civilian volunteers died fighting back. Hamas stormed in, burning homes and killing families, according to the soldiers. As it took so long to secure the kibbutz, the army couldn't recover all the civilian dead until this morning. These were the bodies of Israelis. Decomposing Hamas gunmen are still lying where they were killed. The murder of Israeli civilians here was without doubt a war crime. But what about the Palestinian civilians Israel is killing in attacks on Hamas? As you know, all armies have obligations under the laws of war to protect civilian life, even in war zones. Are you doing this with this level of airstrikes that are going on at the moment and you know, any I, ground operation that I, might happen? I'm sure that we fight for our value and our culture all our life. And you know, you fought with value and you keep your value in the same time, and I know that we will be very aggressive. 
and very strong, but we keep our moral and our value. We are Israeli, we are Jewish, and you know, war is a very difficult theater, a lot of problem. People that stay in, in uh, uh, the battlefield are suffer a lot. You can see what happened in here. But we come to kill an enemy, not a civilian in their bed. But in only a few days, Israel has inflicted immense damage in Gaza. They've cut off supplies of food, water and power and killed hundreds of civilians. Palestinian suffering, Israel says, is the responsibility of Hamas. Israel's already been accused of breaking the laws of war, and that will get louder as more Palestinian civilians are wounded and killed. At Kfar Aza, Israeli troops were thinking of what's next, perhaps a ground invasion of Gaza. It was tough enough for the Israelis to come in to recapture this area, these small border communities. It is a different order of military challenge to cross the wire, to get into Gaza, potentially to fight house to house at a time when Hamas will have made its plans and will be waiting. Some of these men are moving north in case war starts with Hezbollah, the powerful Lebanese militia backed by Iran. What happened here is why Israel is shaken to its core, why it insists it must break Hamas, and it points to the danger and uncertainty ahead. Our international editor, Jeremy Bowen there. Well, let's take you live to Gaza and show you the scene there. Uh, a few moments ago, we actually saw an explosion uh, across the sky. You can see there the aftermath of that, the smoke hanging in the air. And of course, we will be keeping across uh, the scene from Gaza throughout the show. Um, and as I've been mentioning there, we have been seeing uh, at regular intervals, flashes of missiles exploding across the skyline. Now, 900 people have been killed, including 260 children and 230 women, along with 4,600 wounded in the Gaza Strip since Saturday. Those figures have come to us from the health ministry there, uh, and they've come into us in the last few minutes. Some other breaking news that also has come into the newsroom in the last few moments, and that's from America, where we're hearing that US Secretary of State Antony Blinken will travel to Israel in the coming days. Um, now, let's go back to our international editor, Jeremy Bowen, earlier. He gave us the latest on those claims from the Israeli military that what happened was a massacre with women and children and babies killed by Hamas. Well, it seems pretty clear that there was a massacre because, as I said in the piece, uh, the army didn't get in there. The Israeli army didn't even start trying to regain the area. Uh, for 12 hours after Hamas got in there. So basically they were able to rampage around. The uh, senior officers there told me that the kibbutz uh, civilian guard, which is com was composed of people with military experience, that they fought, they tried to fight back, but there weren't many of them and they got killed and their bodies were among those being uh, recovered today. Uh, outside, as you saw in the piece, there was a woman uh, who was under a, uh, a purple sleeping bag. Uh, one of the soldiers said to me that, uh, an officer said to me that she'd been beheaded. I have to say I did not move the covering to see if he was telling the truth, but she was undoubtedly killed in the front garden of her own house. So I think the word massacre is appropriate to what happened there. But w what struck me in Kfar Aza was that it really does sum up all the reasons why Israelis are so shocked, traumatized, why they're so angry, why they want not just revenge, but the government wants to change the strategic equation in Gaza so Hamas can't do anything like this again. But it, this is the Middle East. It's a volatile area and the way ahead is not smooth for anybody. Well, as, as Israelis mourn, Gaza is also reeling from relentless missile attacks. As we were saying earlier, Palestinian health officials say the number of people killed by rocket attacks in Gaza has risen now to 900. Well, the United Nations has told Israel that its siege of the territory is illegal with food, water and power 
all cut off. Now, the BBC has had a rare insight into the Gaza Strip through the eyes of our correspondent, Rushdie Abu Alouf. Now, he's lived there his entire life and has reported on the conflict for decades. Now, as I'm sure you will understand, the situation there is extremely dangerous, so much so that it's not possible for him to report live for us this evening. But Rushdie did send us this update earlier from Gaza. Very quickly, if we can see the scale of destruction in this neighborhood, it's called Rimal neighborhood. It's the economic hub for uh, Gaza that has been completely uh, 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 targeted yesterday. Many buildings were uh, destroyed. Behind me is the 11-story uh, building that was knocked down uh, two days ago, but uh, the destruction in this area is quite recently. It's been targeted uh, last night. Israel said they have carried out 200 airstrikes targeting the uh, Hamas uh, infrastructure. In fact, they, they hit many uh, buildings, government buildings belong to the Hamas-run authority, but look to the scale of destruction in the area and how the civilian homes were uh, uh, completely uh, affected and uh, uh, some of them were completely uh, uh, destroyed. Well, this gentleman just told us that we, had to, we have to leave the, the area because it seems that the Israelis are warning the uh, resident of that area that they should leave they are going to target another uh, building uh, in the uh, uh, area. But look to the scale of destruction. This is happening uh, overnight with Israeli targeting uh, houses, shops, uh, uh, ministries, mosques, everything. The whole neighborhood was leveled to, uh, to zero. This is one of the uh, most important economic hubs for Gaza, where, as you can see, most of the shops were damaged, houses were damaged, uh, infrastructure, street, this is the uh, street that leads to the uh, southern part of the city. It's completely blocked. Well, to discuss this all further, I'm joined now by Colin P. Clark, Director of Research at the Sufan Group, where his research focuses on terrorism, international security and geopolitics. And I'm also joined by Robin Wright from The New Yorker. She's an American foreign affairs analyst and an expert on the region who's been reporting from the Middle East for decades. Thanks very much uh, to both of you for joining us this evening on The Context. Um, Colin, let's start with you where do you think see things standing right now uh, in regards to this ongoing conflict well thanks for having me uh, it seems like the Israelis are trying to decide whether or not they're going to launch a full-scale ground invasion of Gaza uh, and with that comes its own set of complications this is a densely populated area uh, we know that there is a subterranean network of tunnels and moreover unlike you know previous conflicts this one is is further complicated by the presence of large numbers of hostages. So uh, if the Israelis are going to invade and potentially occupy, uh, the Israel Defense Forces, the IDF, certainly have their hands full. Robin, let's bring you in. You've been reporting from the region for many, many years. Um, when do you think there might be a land incursion from Israel? Oh, I think it's probably imminent. The question really is, can Israel actually defeat Hamas? Can it eliminate it to the point that it is no longer a major political or military challenge? And I think there are real questions. Short term, Israel has the might, the will uh, to impose severe damage to whether it's command posts, Hamas arsenal, its leadership, uh, its infrastructure. But what happens then? Who rules Hamas? I mean, who rules Gaza? Uh, how do you make sure that, Ga that the Gaza is not a threat to Israel down the road, whether it's from Hamas or others? And of course, the bigger picture is, as the ground assault begins, what might other parties in the Middle East do? The United States is scrambling right now to help Israel with military equipment and to deploy its own forces around the region, not in uh, Israel, but as a sign as a warning to other parties not to get involved. But the real danger is the threat from particularly Hamas on Israel's northern border. Does it at some point engage, not because it wanted to at the beginning, but because it now feels that it's obliged to help uh, another proxy ally under the Iranian so-called axis of resistance? So there are a lot of questions down the road. We all know what's going to happen next. We all know that Israel can probably prevail. But the bigger issues are what happens kind of long term in strategy and how do you counter the potential for other threats and a wider conflagration? 
Colin, let's look at the um, military capabilities of both Israel and of Hamas. I was looking at some of the numbers according to the International Institute of Strategic Studies that says the, the Israeli armed forces have uh, close to 170,000 people, including around 126,000 in the land army, um, 400,000 reservists also on call. That's as opposed to Hamas that has around 20,000 in the Al Qassam brigades. Um, how do both armies, as it were, match up to each other? Well, it's, it's David and Goliath. Uh, it's really a kind of asymmetric conflict. However, uh, with the help of Iran and with the help of allies like Hezbollah, Hamas has prepared to fight an asymmetric conflict uh, to win the battle of, quote unquote, hearts and minds uh, in international opinion. Uh, and really, they're fighting on their home turf. Again, I, I just mentioned subterranean network of tunnels. Uh, they're going to go to ground. They're going to wage guerrilla tactics. Uh, and they're likely going to attempt to continue to penetrate Israel, shooting rockets. What we saw uh, over the weekend was really a combined arms maneuver that we haven't seen from Hamas in previous conflicts. Now, think about it. Operation Cast Lead, 2008-2009. Pillar of Defense, 2012. Protective Edge, 2014. The Israelis have attempted to wipe out Hamas numerous times. They've been unable to do it. And I don't see anything that proves to me now that they're going to be able to, to follow through and finish the job this time. Robin, can I bring you in on that very point as well? What's your analysis of that? We heard from Colin saying he doesn't think they're going to be able to follow through on that. I covered the 1973 war a half century ago, and that was a far easier uh, kind of equation. This was state versus state that Israel knew the address of its enemy. It, it knew what the diplomatic options were, it knew what the military options were as army to army. For ever since the 1973 war, Israel's main rivals have been non-state actors. They've been militias. And as Israel discovered in, uh, in Lebanon during the war with Hezbollah, it's very hard to beat a militia. And the United States learned that lesson in Afghanistan against the Taliban and in Iraq against ISIS. Israel in 2000 ended up withdrawing unilaterally from Lebanon because it knew it couldn't defeat, in the conventional sense, a militia. And that's the challenge that Israel faces today, even though it is far better armed, far better trained, far better equipped in confronting a much smaller and in some ways ragtag militia. Robin Wright and Colin P. Clark, thank you very much for bringing us your insight on this story. Around the world and across the UK, this is BBC News. Let's take a look at some of the other stories making the news across the UK. The International Monetary Fund says the UK faces another five years of huge interest rates to stem rising prices. The organisation expects the UK to have the highest inflation and slowest growth next year of any G7 economy, including the US, France, Germany, Canada, Italy and Japan. Holly Willoughby's told ITV she will not be returning to This Morning, adding that it had been an honour just to be part of its story, but that she had to make the decision for her and her family. A 36-year-old man was last week charged over an alleged plot to kidnap and murder Miss Willoughby. She'd presented the programme for 14 years. The Home Office says it's begun notifying asylum seekers they'll be sent back to a migrant barge off the coast of, south coast of England after the vessel completed all necessary tests. 39 men were moved onto the vessel in August but were removed when Legionella bacteria was found on board the vessel. You're live with BBC News. Well, let's take, take a look now at how one of Israel's closest allies, the US, has been reacting. US President Joe Biden and his team have met in the Situation Room to discuss next steps. And you can see the president here, also amongst those in the room, Vice President Kamala Harris and Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who we've just heard is going to be travelling to Israel in the coming days. Well, President Biden said the team connected directly with Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to discuss coordination to support Israel, deter hostile actions and protect innocent people. 
and in the last hour, the president's been speaking directly to the American people. Mr Biden confirmed that Americans are among the dead and among those being held hostage by Hamas. He also called the attacks from Hamas an act of sheer evil and said that the US is ready to send additional assets to Israel to give it any support it needs to respond. So in this moment, we must be crystal clear. We stand with Israel. We stand with Israel. And we will make sure Israel has what it needs to take care of its citizens, defend itself, and respond to this attack. There's no justification for terrorism. There's no excuse. Hamas does not stand for the Palestinian people's right to dignity and self-determination. The stated purpose is the annihilation of the state of Israel and the murder of Jewish people. Well, we can now cross live to Joel Rubin, a Democratic strategist and former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in President Obama's administration. Good to have you with us here on The Context on BBC News. Uh, let me first start by getting your reaction to that address to the nation that President Biden just delivered. Uh, thank you, Regina, for having me. Uh, this really was a powerful statement. It was brief. It was succinct to the point. Uh, President Biden explained his view, which is uh, embedded in historical narrative of the Jewish people and the Jewish people's suffering, but also in his personal direct experience with Israel. Uh, he recalled his meeting with Golda Meir 50 years ago, uh, where she told him that the uh, Israelis had nowhere to go but there to paraphrase it, and so they would stay and fight. And so I think his uh, mission was to provide heart as well as hardware, and he accomplished that in this, in this speech. And we've just heard, uh, Joel, that uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is going to be visiting Israel. They don't say when exactly, yeah. but they say in the coming days. What will that trip likely achieve? You know, it's probably going to be this combination of heart and hardware, where uh, Secretary Blinken, who is Jewish, I'm confident that he will be there to mourn the, the, the deaths and, and do it in the accordance with Jewish tradition. Uh, I'm Jewish, too, and there, there's a day, there is a period of mourning, and, and there's going to be, uh, Israel will be in mourning for a number of days going forward. And then he's going to get strategic and talk brass tacks, and hopefully there will be uh, a unity government in Israel that he can work with that will span the whole spectrum of Israeli politics. And, and my bet is that he's going to try to coordinate with Israel and also lay out some parameters uh, potentially of what uh, could be an American position about how Israel should go about conducting its, its uh, likely uh, war and potentially invasion into Gaza. And, you know, as we've been reporting in the last few days, this was unprecedented. We haven't seen anything like this in decades. Does it in any yeah. way change the course of U.S. foreign policy on this ongoing issue in the Middle East? You know, Regina, I've been talking to a lot of people in Washington about this, and, and the, the term that comes to mind most frequently uh, uh, used is uh, this is an inflection point. We are now at a new moment on uh, Israel and Palestine uh, Washington has woken up to a new reality on the ground. It's different today than it was a few days ago. And so what that means in terms of policy uh, is still to be determined. But without a doubt that the status quo, uh, both from a diplomatic perspective and the military perspective, uh, that no longer exists. And we're just over a year away from a U.S. presidential election. How much, yeah. if at all, does this play into this? And you're running as well, is that correct? That's right. Uh, running for Congress. And I'll, I'll tell you, um, it's been a very disheartening few days, quite frankly, as an American and a national security expert to watch Republicans take cheap shots at President Biden. Uh, before we even knew the full extent of the attacks, uh, Republicans were attacking President Biden and blaming him for somehow appeasing terrorists and getting money into Israel from the hostage deal that was conducted recently with Iran, uh, a falsehood in, in and of itself, a provable one. Uh, so that's very disappointing. And now the House of Representatives is uh, dysfunctional without a leader, a, a speaker. And so the Republicans need to get their house in order and start standing with the United States okay. uh, foreign policy. And hopefully we'll see that in the coming days. Joel, we're just coming to the end of this half hour. Thank